Hello, welcome to Celluloid Mirror. I'm your hostess, Betty St. Laveau. On this show, we talk about movies, movie history. Once in a while, we do some film lists, and today I've got a whole bunch of them. I hope you like them. Um, besides that, we're going to do a few, we're going to hit on a couple of reality TV shows because I've been looking at them on YouTube, and one uh, comedy that I've watched at least five times in the last three days. Okay, so let's start off with our first list. The first one, this is called uh, No One Looks Like Them. And I'll do these lists where I compare actors and actresses saying that they look like one another. On this list, no one looks like anyone in the film world, so let's give it a whirl. Viola Davis, Raquel Welch, Samuel L. Jackson, Bob Stanwyck, Joseph Cotton, Greg Peck, Paul Newman, Linda Carter, Default Gail Godot, uh, Sophia Loren, Halle Berry, Gina Gershon, Russell Wong, Jessica Lange, Chow Yun Fat, Morris Chestnut, Chris Pine, Rod Steger, and Elelia. All right, those people look like no one else in the Hollywood firmament. Just my opinion. There might be some twinsies of them out there, but I haven't met one yet. Okay, so the next list is going to be a brothers list. And this particular list has to do with the groupings of brothers in Hollywood. I got this idea because I saw a trailer for a Owen Wilson movie, but then Luke is doing a TV show. And so I'm like, hmm, the Wilson brothers, they're a, uh, they're like an iconic grouping in Hollywood to me. So we'll start off with them, Owen and Luke Wilson. And I believe that they actually start off as screenwriters. Now, I forgot one thing. The Bridges brothers are actually my numero uno for Hollywood brothers, Jeff and Bo Bridges, be because they're adored their father, Lloyd, and he kind of began the family business of acting. So actually the Bridges brothers are my numero uno. The Wilson brothers are my second. Then we'll go to the Stallone brothers, Sly and Frank, the Carradine brothers, Bobby, Keith, and David, uh, the Keach brothers, Stacy and James, the Phoenix brothers, um, oh, pardon me, um, the Rivers Brothers, Joachim and Phoenix, the Casty Brothers, David and Sean, the Marx Brothers, Harpo, Groucho, Zeppo, I can't remember the other one, the Smothers Brothers, Tom and Dick, the Hudson Brothers, Goldie Married One, Bill Hudson, the Wayans Brothers, of course, Damon, Mullen, Sean, and Keenan, and the Murphy Brothers, Eddie and Charlie. Let's not forget the Warner Brothers and the Maya, uh, Maya Brothers who had studios in Hollywood. All right, I like that list quite a bit. Um, I'm going to do a sister's list, and I have a working list of family uh, down below, so we're going to start off with the King family for that, but I kind of like that list. Okay, next we have... I might have mentioned this on the last episode, the iconic unnamed British heroine list. There are a few of them. They don't really pop up in America, but I could find some, but not so much movies or books, but they definitely are in cinema. So there are three of them. Julie Christie's Darling, and she's usually just called Darling throughout the whole movie, but you know that that's not her name. Um, Actually, her name is Diana, but they mentioned that last. So we'll uh, give Darling as our default uh, uh, iconic unnamed British heroine. The next uh, heroine is Rebecca, and that's Joan Fontaine. In Rebecca, we're dealing with the other so much that you would think the narrator herself would be in the background, but because the narrator is unnamed, we uh, notice her all of the more. That's what I think. And then, of course, we have uh, 
our Phoebe uh, Waller Bridges uh, tormentedly charming or charmingly tormented flea bag. And for Darling, we see the unnamed heroine running up the ladder of society. In Rebecca, we see the individual dealing with the person who's not in the room. And in Fleabag, we find the heroine finding her way through life. I like that list quite a bit. All right, so now I'm going to give some shout outs to some of my viewing uh, material I've been doing via YouTube. Please check some of these uh, great content creators out. Because of them, I feel like I am. Like, I thank them because I think that they've helped me improve my show a little bit better. So, Crime Reel and Briefcase are my, um, they're my crime senseis. I really enjoy them. They upload a mystery once a week, Mondays and Wednesdays. I think. And then we have Case Files Presents. And uh, those are a little bit longer than Crime Reel and Briefcases episodes. Very involved. Uh, there's a disclaimer beforehand talking about if you can't really do hardcore crime, you know, it's best to listen to something else. Very enjoyable. In a different genre, we've got my man Travel Matic. Right now, he's been going all over Mexico. I think the last three or four months, tasting great barbecues and the sights are divine. Please check out my Travel Matic guy. Uh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson and Chael Sonnen are my fighters that I go to semi immediately when they upload. I like Michael Bisping's. Um, believe you me either, uh, but Chael sort of me first, um, sensei fighter, and then Wonder Boy sort of me second at right now. For uh, other viewing that involves MMA, Alpaca Thesaurus has begun to upload Sunday. Please check him out, 2 p.m. He's such a great uh, breakdowner of the MMA psychology behind how the guys are moving around and relating to one another. He's live too, so you can even call him. If you ha have been a subscriber, you usually will be able to make contact with him via phone. Please check him out. Then we have my man Ken and Kay TV, who is the sensei who has been helping me the most lately. Uh, Mr. Alpaca was taking a little hiatus. Uh, Mr. Korov is sort of my primary sensei, but so is Ken and Kay. He's been studying the art ever since he was young. Um, whenever he's doing a live show, he's got a great sense of humor and he's brilliant. Jim Can't Swim is my psychology uh, my criminal psychology professor, he doesn't upload frequently, but he's got at least a dozen episodes up. Really like his style. His production values are excellent. And then the last three I just want to give a shout out to are The Weasel, Mind Smash, and Mix Molly Whoppery. They're also um, MMA shows. So just when you're doing your YouTube stuff, maybe you check out these great content creators, you might enjoy what they have to offer. Okay, now we're almost getting closer and closer to movie time. We're, but before that, we're gonna start off with these two reality TV shows that I was watching during the pandemic. I probably mentioned one of them before. The Firstly, Hustle and Soul is a show about the Pink Teacup restaurant in Brooklyn. It's run by a man named Lawrence Page. And uh, Thandy, Candace, and Sana are three ladies who work for him. Anna is his fiance, and he has two twin. He has twins who are waiters. Two waiters uh, who happen to be twins uh, working for him. I have never in my life seen such a spectacle of cussing and swearing and fist throwing in a restaurant. So, I thought. This must be scripted, but even if it was scripted, it's a scandal. And then someone on YouTube said, oh, they're probably British actors acting out what 
they think Americans act like in a restaurant. At any rate, the show ran for three seasons. I only watched the first season. I couldn't even believe I watched all six episodes. I just wanted to see what happened next. Nothing good. At any rate, because of that show, um, my algorithm popped up the Bad Girls Club. And I started watching these clips. So shame on me because I probably shouldn't have watched them, but they were quite entertaining, especially at first, because you cannot believe that young women act like that. And excuse me, but I might not know a lot of young women that age in this um, area, but I have nieces who are that age, and they do not act like that, and neither do their friends, all right? So I started watching the clips with one of my sisters, and then a couple seasons popped up on Hulu, and so I watched two of those seasons, and if you follow the story, instead of just looking at the clips, some of the action makes sense, but all the action is just bad. The girls are a lot of times half undressed. Hey, excuse me, I was watching it, but they're also throwing up their fists a lot. They're acting aggressive with one another, but I guess the show couldn't be built on everyone hopping and skipping and sing Kumbaya every night. At any rate, I want to do a little bit more research before I talk about but I decided to talk about today. I'll probably talk about it again. But I did, I did watch the shows, and at some point, um, <laughs> at some point I would just like to do a show and make a compilation and discuss how reality TV came to be, but also how it's not really reality TV, so that's just uh, something for another day. At any rate, it's disgraceful and enjoyable at the same time. This fight's at the drop of a hat. There is soft and hardcore porn, unfortunately. I mean, I, did, I, I consider some of that porn. And a lot of trash talk. At any rate, it ran on oxygen and then it got canceled, as did this other show. And producers go too far when the lowest common denominator is violence. But I just want to say that there is a market for stuff like that. And um, you, it doesn't make, you're not a bad person by marketing it. I don't think you're really a bad person by being a producer and you're certainly not a bad person for watching it, but it is very odd that there's stuff like that on TV, just saying. Okay, so now we are going to get to the, Oh, we're almost there. Uh, I just want to discuss this review that I watched uh, that regarded The Mandalorian as not a bad show or not a good show. And the content creator who did the review, let's see, it's The Worm's Hole, I think it is. I have a couple different... Um, reviews of The Mandalorian on here because people are reacting to it and look, the first time I saw Baby Yoda, I, I want one for my birthday. The dang thing is cute. John Thoreau made up that doll, by the way. So I've seen the ads for it, but I feel like what Bill Maher said about the show. Uh, there has been some controversy regarding one of the stars who got fired and Bill Maher goes, this is a show that I wouldn't even watch if I was in prison. <laughs> when he said it was funny, maybe me saying it's not as funny, but it is funny. Like there are some shows that you're like, whatever, especially if, if it's a big corporation like Disney, uh, that uh, the reviewer and I feel don't treat their audience with respect. Like they kind of do a formula, form, uh, formula, formula thing. All right, so um, yes, Midnight Edge did a review on The Mandalorian March 31st, 2020, and my man here, The Worm's Hole, did his review December 2020, so I'm just going to quote from him, and also, I've just recently been checking him out, maybe you can check out his show too. So he stated with his review that he wanted to be pro-art, and I thought that was a very positive thing because it's very easy to pick apart something you don't like, make fun of it, blah, blah. That's not always 
the best, it can be counterproductive. So sometimes it's good to critique stuff that you like and that you dig. So he said there was a lot to like about mainly Grogu, that's Baby Yoda's name. And he said visually the show is great. He didn't really like the writing and the, story t and the storytelling. He felt like it was a big commercial, but he liked the Boba Fett character and he liked Baby Yoda. Mainly, he talked about Baby Yoda. He also talked about how um, the show, uh, it seems to follow this formula where the armor is important and dude man wearing the armor is always either fixing a disagreement between someone or there's an escort uh, project going on. What else do you say? Yeah, they're, they're, he upgrades the armor and everybody else sort of wants it. So there are people trying to take his armor. He also very lovingly complained about how the fact that there are several episodes where Baby Yoda looks like he's going to get shot and he doesn't. But, you know, of course Baby Yoda's not going to get shot. And the other thing that my man said is that we all know that the show is going to be going on for another 20 years. There's nothing wrong with shows like this. Um, I kind of wish I was into the Star Wars thing. I've, I've seen, saw the first three movies. I don't really have Star Wars fever, but I always liked science fiction more so when I was a kid. But um, Disney, they, 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 drop the, they drop the ball a little bit. You, you have to pay a lot of money for their package. To me, that's a lot of money a month for, to, to watch movies that I might already own. They kind of are the evil empire to me, but again, maybe you have to have an evil empire when it comes to movies, you know? I mean, everything else has an evil empire, even food. So at any rate, I really liked the Worm's Hole review of The Mandalorian, and there are other great reviews about that show too. Uh, I'll probably, I, I got more enjoyment, I get more enjoyment listening to people talk about than I think I would watching it. So I just want to put that out there. I might check it out though. Now, uh, we are going to come to the movie that I've watched at least five times in the last three days. And that is the very funny um, Supervised with Tom Berenger, Lou Gossett Jr., Fanulia Fenul Flanagan, um, Bo Bridges, and Ned Dennehy, Clive Russell, Fiona Glass, Elia ba ba Baskin, and Aaron Hefferman, and the show stopping Kira Abiscara, who played Celestro. Okay, so this movie has made me laugh. I really like it. I've always liked Tom Berenger. Moss sat me down for Shattered years ago. I really liked that movie quite a bit. And um, the plot of Shattered is totally awesome. Basically, and I don't know if I, I talked, I didn't look at my archives. I might have discussed Shattered last episode, episode before, but he's an architect who has amnesia. He's trying to get to the root of the mystery and he succeeds with the help of Bob Hoskins. That, that's basically the main plot. It has Greta Saatchi, Corbin Berenson, and Joanne Wally Kilmer. And supervised, um, several superheroes are dying of uni, okay, of boredom, all right? And a retirement home, and it's made exactly for superheroes. And Tom Berenger, once again, is getting to the root of the problem. He's trying to find something out. So for me, it was almost a play on some of the roles I'd seen him do. And then at other times, it's a movie about how life might be dull, but it shouldn't be dull. Why don't we just do something? And so... That's actually what these 
elderly folks do in the old, old, old home folks all day. <laughs> they get into mischief, pardon, and they finally hit upon a mystery that they have to solve. I thought the writing was great. I didn't mind the special effects one bit. One wag of a critic said, oh, they're going to be making fun of those special effects on uh, that show one day. But I don't think so. The, the special effects stood up for what, it, for what they were. Plus, I didn't write their names down. The guys who did those special effects worked on the thriller video and the aha video. So the effects are fine with me. And, and both those videos, uh, those iconic videos are great. So I really enjoyed the writing. I couldn't believe that Bo Bridges was playing a 70 year old. He looks, he looks about dang near 45 years old. He looks younger than I do, okay? And I love Fanola Flanagan's character. She's very, um, I mean, if I hit 75, I hope I look that sexy. That's, I mean, really, she, she was fantastic. It wasn't all about her being beautiful, but she's beautiful, okay? So the plot was fine. I didn't mind the plot at all. Um, the showstopper for me, who I really, really enjoyed, was our... Um, Hiran Abiskaya, and I am so, pardon me for not pronouncing that name correctly, it has a, I'm having trouble with my R's today, but Hiran did such a good job. He's only in the movie for a hot minute, he steals the show, he's actually a Shakespearean trained actor, I can't wait to see him in, he's been in Salimbine, Hamlet, and Midsummer's Night's Dream. And I'm almost positive those are BBC productions. I think that they were, they were filmed. Um, is that it? Got the rest of the cast here. All right, so it was written by Andy Briggs and Roger Drew, Ed Dyson and John Niven. The casting was by Alex Johnson and Louise Kelly. The cinematographer was Sam Rental. Uh, the art direction was Christy Mc. Christy Mc, oh, I wrote that too fast. Sorry, Christine. Christine McDar McDarcy, I think. And there were 11 stunt people, four of them with the last name Condren, Joe, Sean, Tony, and James. I thought that was pretty cool. It's directed by John Cavanaugh. And um, I put some stuff here about Mr. Berenger just because... He was born in Chicago like me, but he was in Platoon, Big Chill, The Substitute, Training Day, and Inception. He's married four times and he has six children. All right, so I think that that's it for me today. I'm your hostess, Betty St. Laveau. I hope you've enjoyed our mixed bag redux. Um, I'd like to thank Kenrick Nair, Tony, Zach, Rob, Chris, Brett, and Jen for helping me sub my show all these years. Thank you very much. Um, I'd also would like to thank um, Mr. Lowell Smith all those years ago for supplying me with all of these movies and all of these ideas to start my own show. And... Um, to all of the assistant directors and the assistant producers and the gaffers and electricians and the best boys that we've never seen because it actually takes thousands of people to make a movie, especially if there are several locations. All right, um, until next time, you little chillins, um, stay away from all those bad movies. Ciao.